In this episode of Car Fiction on Roadshow, we'll be looking at the McLaren GT and the epic McLaren Senna. But to kick off, here is the McLaren 720S Spider. Welcome to Arizona, where the McLaren 720S joins the Tarantula, the Southern Black Widow and the Brown Recluse in the local I Spy book of spiders. This is a car that lets you get the wind in your hair, the sun on your face, hear the sound of a... Hang on, hang on a minute, I haven't even put the roof down yet. And it's worth actually saying that this is a spider that feels completely uncompromised in terms of, well livability when it's got its roof up. This amazing new single piece roof with this glass that at the touch of a button goes from dark to light, alters its tinting. And in here you really couldn't tell whether this was a spider with a roof up or a coupe. You've still got wonderful visibility all around and this new roof has actually got two patents. One of them's to do with the synchronicity of how all the motors work together and the other is to do with the, how the buttresses join to the tonneau cover at the back. There's amazing glazed buttresses so you've still got a really good view out the back which is obviously something that was integral to what made the 720S coupe so special. Anyway, as it will now lower at a slightly higher speed of 30 miles an hour, I'll put it down. One thing you certainly don't lose by taking the roof off is speed. <laughs> Not surprising perhaps when you've still got a 710 brake horsepower turbocharged 4 litre V8 allied to a dry weight of just 1,332 kilos. The official McLaren figures, incidentally, set on optional coarser tyres, cheeky a 0 to 62 miles an hour in 2.9 seconds which is identical to the coupe even up to 124 miles an hour or 200 clicks it's 7.9 which is just a tenth behind what's more flat out this will do 212 miles an hour which again identical to the coupe with the roof down it'll do 202 miles an hour so you're hardly missing out must be being close to being sucked straight out of the roof at that sort of speed McLaren has actually trimmed the aerodynamic package so that it's different depending on whether you've got the roof up or down as to what that big rear wing does. And of course with the roof down, whilst this is not the most musical engine as we've always said, you do get more of the pops and bangs and cracks, so you feel much more connected to it. So the 720S's supremely impressive habitability and usability haven't been compromised in the Spider, and thanks to narrow A-pillows and the beautiful glazed buttresses, visibility out of it has been maintained too. But what about the dynamics? When the 720S Coupe was launched, there were a few questions about the Spider version, because the Coupe's carbon fibre chassis, the Monocage 2, isn't just a tub like its predecessors, it has a spine that arches all the way over the top. And in order to create the spider, McLaren has obviously had to dispense with that stiffening spar. And so now we have Monocage 2S. The trouble is, and I explained in our film on the 570S spider, that cutting away a structurally important roof is a bit like taking out the top tube of a conventional bicycle. McLaren has of course counteracted this by adding more strength into the A-pillars, C-pillars and the rear deck of the carbon chassis. But the question remains, has it worked? This is quite a bumpy road and just occasionally it does feel like there's a bit more shake perhaps, it's only through the steering wheel. It doesn't feel quite as supremely, unimpeachably smooth as the last 720S I drove on an equally bumpy road in Wales. It was something of a shock to find that the 720S Spider didn't have an identical feeling of rigidity to the coupe, as it's a trait we've come to expect from McLaren. The 600LT Spider that I drove on the same launch, for example, was indistinguishable from the coupe version. 
but there was definite shake and shudder through the wheel of the 720S Spider on a bumpy road, and the suspension felt harsher and less absorbent than the coupe in sport mode, making it a little more difficult to place the nose with complete accuracy. Don't get me wrong, it's still lots of fun, and it's not as compromised as some convertible supercars I've driven, but the difference is nonetheless noticeable. Put into the active panel with Sport. Change the chassis to Sport as well. It definitely gets firmer. The engine gets more insistent, you get more of those cracks. Pops. <laughs> as the engineers always do at McLaren, they've tried very hard to keep weight to a minimum. So this is only 49 kilos heavier than the coupe. So down a really great bit of canyon road like this, it still feels fantastic in the way it changes direction. What an amazing piece of road this is. But what I've been thinking about is that there seems to be a sort of new breed of supercar that this is at the sort of the vanguard of really, because, well, there used to be something called the sort of you know, the Super GT, which was a GT car that then was more of a supercar, perhaps. This, to me, is like a super tour. No, not that sort of one. No, not that sort of one. Very cool there they are. No, the the sort of the supercar that you can tour in, because there are all these tours that you can go off around Europe or the UK or even further afield with other supercars and go and explore or well, on your own just use them for what you want to in a way that you wouldn't perhaps have in an F40 say and something like the 720S Spider is just so brilliant at long distances and then when you get to the road of course you've got a you've got a supercar there but if you're going to go touring then well why not have the added benefit of being able to put the roof down so that you can see your surroundings even better smell them look at the particular sites so we're here in Arizona the cactus there's another one and another one and another one and another one and another one in all seriousness this place is absolutely stunning the Sonoran Desert is the only place on Earth where the famous saguaro cactus grows in the wild and they can live for over 200 years, usually only sprouting their first arm at the age of 75. Arizona as a whole is the sixth largest state by area and is 10% bigger than the UK, although with only a tenth of the population. Interestingly, this was also the last of the contiguous states to achieve statehood on the 14th of February 1912 and it is home to the largest Native American territory, the Navajo Nation. Even within a short distance of its capital city, Phoenix, Arizona has this wonderfully huge, empty, untamed frontier feeling. It's fantastic. It's sort of everything you want from the wild West America, really. And is this 720S everything you want from a spider? apart from the lack of eight legs and a venomous bite, obviously. Well, it looks wonderful, particularly in this Belize blue. The new, silently speedy roof is splendidly sophisticated, and the electric chromic glazing is a lovely, albeit expensive, optional feature. The 720S is still stunningly fast, too. But once again, I find myself thinking that McLaren's Super Series car has actually been trumped by its lesser, cheaper, Sport Series brethren. The sublime 570S Spider is simply less compromised dynamically by the lack of a fixed roof. So, if I wanted to wear a Stetson in a supercar and ride off into the sunset, the 570 rather than the 720 would still be my steed of choice. Ye and indeed ha. From the American Southwest we head all the way across the globe to the south of France and a very different kind of car, the McLaren GT.
Instead of the front-engined rear-wheel drive setup you might presume a GT car needs, the McLaren GT sticks with the mid-mounted engine layout we're used to from McLaren. In fact, the engine is a 4-litre twin-turbocharged V8, mid-mounted behind a carbon fibre tub. That sounds very McLaren. At 611 brake horsepower, a 0 to 60 time of 3.2 seconds, and a top speed bothering 200 miles an hour, on paper the McLaren GT sits in a very similar kind of place as its stablemates. But how is it to drive? Can it truly embody all those qualities that we want in a true continent carving GT car? Or is it simply a repackaged 570S or even a repeat of the 570 GT? Well, there's only one way to find out, and we've come to the mountains down here in the south of France to find out exactly that. The first thing that was immediately obvious to me was the steering. It's hefty, it's weighty, it's purposeful, and you feel it. It's real, it feels mechanical, there's nothing intervening between you and the steering. It gives plenty of feedback, I can feel where the car is on the road, but it's not twitchy, it's not immediate, it's purposeful. And on these twisty mountain roads, it feels a little bit weird to be coming into a hairpin like this and the feeling the weight through the steering where a lighter steering would whip me around really quickly. The car turns in perfectly, the steering works, just the weight of it is impressive. The next thing you notice are the brakes. They require effort to push. They are purposeful, much like the steering. They're not twitchy, it's not the slightest press won't stop this car on its nose. You need to give it a firm press to get everything out of them. And that is because this is set up as a GT car. That seems obvious, it being a GT car, but it's still a McLaren, which we previously have only felt do supercar style brakes where you want them to be responsive you want a firm press to set this thing up on its nose because that's how you brake when you're out on track when you're enjoying a car like that with a GT car though you might just want to make very small adjustments in your speed and that means this brake setup works perfectly it becomes wonderfully fun to drive if not the fastest thing to throw around canyon roads and through mountain passes, but certainly something that gives a lot of fulfillment. Where previously we've had supercar expectations from McLaren, asking for the sharpest of handling, the highest degree of responsiveness, and the ability to strip second after second from our lap times, now we'll be asking for something else. Performance has to be married with finesse, comfort, and practicality. Can McLaren deliver that without losing that which made McLaren Automotive able to go shoulder to shoulder with the likes of Ferrari? Can it now also pick a fight with Aston Martin and win? Other GT cars come at it from the opposite direction. Consider the Continental GT. Bentley comes from a background of making big limousine cars and the GT says we can still do all of that luxury limousine style comfort but we can dial in a dynamic part of the driving as well. We can add that to the mix. This car comes from the opposite direction. McLaren already have that built into their DNA, but now they're proving that they can repackage it into something that's comfortable on long distances. The end result for the handling is a car that, in a straight line, off the mark, can hold its own against its supercar brothers and sisters, but that will undoubtedly not be able to give you the same thrill or lap times out on track. But the track is the last place the McLaren GT should be found. Use it for what it's designed for, long stretches of autobahn, cross-continental journeys, and taking advantage of the odd quiet country road, and the GT delivers. Its forgiving nature allows you to feel safe and secure at speed, giving you the tools to react to the road beneath you, trading pin-sharp responsiveness for weighty confidence. McLaren says this has proactive dampening, meaning that it's not just reacting to what's happening on the road, it's actually using the information you're giving the car through your inputs and what it's sensing from the road to predict what's going to happen next. I mean, it's not clairvoyant, but it certainly helps it make up its mind a fraction of a second earlier than it would have done otherwise. It gives you the opportunity to be a little bit more dynamic through the corners and throw it around a bit, and the car soaks it up perfectly. It's not only unlike any other McLaren. The GT feels like it occupies a completely unique spot amongst all GTs. 
With the center of gravity pushed much further back than you would have in a front engine GT, even twistier, more challenging roads don't upset the composure. Engine noise wise, this has a different characteristic to all other McLarens. Even though it has a quite similar four liter V8 twin turbo engine, the length of the car has added new opportunities for the sound to be, well, different, more GT-like. It's deeper, it's rumblier. And when you put it into sport mode, and it opens up those valves. It's not overwhelming, it's not terribly aggressive, but it gives you feedback, it gives you confidence. It's, it's a nice sound. You still get that McLaren experience. I mean, zero to 62 is 3.2 seconds. That is proper supercar quick. It doesn't feel like that in normal driving. It feels a little bit more sluggish. The throttle response is dialed in for a GT car. So unless you have it in the most track focused modes, it's not twitchy, responsive and quick. It requires a bit of time to spool up. It's because it doesn't want to throw you off balance really quickly. It wants to keep you composed. If you change your mind, the car softens that process of changing its attitude so you're not being pitched and rolled. Visually, it retains a lot of what makes McLarens instantly recognizable. Overall, the design is relatively minimalistic. That modern mid-engine silhouette untroubled by extra creases or wings. Bar the huge side intakes that dominate the side mirror when you're looking back, it's the most modest looking car McLaren have ever produced. But still, at a glance, you are in no doubt that this came from Woking. In terms of the interior, it is very much a McLaren interior. It has never felt like they've made as much effort for the pomp and pageantry of getting into a really special car. A Ferrari, for example, from my opinion, has always had a little bit more attention to making it feel like you're sat in somewhere extra special. But this, as a GT car, has some great touches that McLaren have added in. The minimalist approach means there's not a huge amount of stuff to take your attention away. The trim around the controls and around the screen all make it feel like a nicer place to be than some other McLarens. And the star of the show for me is the steering wheel, not adorned with a million buttons, but this single piece of aluminium billet right in the middle. So downside to that is when you're making a three point turn, it actually blocks the screen from the rear view camera on there. Little bit of a downside. Another slight gripe is the seating position. Now I've set this seat as low as possible, but unfortunately it still feels like I am so high up that I'm being denied some of my view from the top of the A-pillar, the roof here, and the visibility out of this car is hindered by it. Right now, through the huge bit of glass at the back, I've actually got reasonable view out the back, but we've been traveling with luggage in there, and as soon as we put our bags in there, I can't see Jack. But surely the point of having a front engine setup for a GT car is that it allows you greater boot space. One of the key ingredients of a GT car, I hear you cry. And you're right. Normally a mid-engine car would struggle to accommodate much in the way of luggage. The McLaren GT, however, got round this by dropping the engine lower down, moving as much of the engine out to the sides as possible. It's what gives the McLaren GT such wide haunches and why it needs those huge air intakes on the side. Extra heat insulation between the engine and the luggage compartment minimizes heat transfer to your suitcases. It won't keep ice cream solid for very long, but it's perfectly safe. The luggage compartment is in fact large enough to accommodate a full-size adult man. Ask me how I know. Add to that the frunk, and you actually have more total luggage space than some hatchbacks. You're not going to be able to help anyone move house, but you can get a whole lot more in there than you would ever think. I have to say, with everything included, with any bad points that I've highlighted in the car, I do really, really like it. I'm a big fan of McLaren's. A lot of their cars I find a lot of fun to drive and I was unsure about this car. And although I'm still not 100% sold on its looks, throwing it around these roads out here, I really appreciate the difference this has between it and the Sport Series. When McLaren told us years ago that their cars would stick to the categorization of sports, super, and ultimate, it made a lot of sense. 
a one-dimensional categorization that clearly shows that there is a single-mindedness to what a McLaren is, and the only difference is how much you're willing to spend on it, how track-focused it is, and how low your lap time can get. Now, with the McLaren GT, it's no longer that simple. The lineup is now multifaceted, and now the Grand Tourers make up a completely separate area for McLaren. The 570 GT was a one-off experiment. The McLaren GT, on the other hand, is a statement of intent for the future. And the likes of Aston Martin and Bentley need to take note, because if there's one thing that McLaren has proven it can do, it's to pull up its own chair to the table and take a seat. GT sits at one end of the McLaren spectrum and right the way on the opposite side is a car that's called Senna for a very good reason. The McLaren Senna is a sensational track car. I know this because I've driven it round Estoril in Portugal where Ayrton Senna had his famous first Formula One win in 1985. But what makes the eponymous car's track performance so impressive is that it has number plates and you can pop out of the pit lane and round the corner to pick up a pint of milk. So, while we could have done a road test in the south of France or the Pyrenees, I wanted to put this extraordinary car through a very real-world evaluation. Something as removed from a racetrack as possible. I wanted to do a drive across the rough and tumble of the B roads of England, to see its alien form amongst ordinary shaped traffic, juxtaposed with thatched cottages. Isolation on a circuit or in a studio where I first saw it, yes, it looks outlandish, but here, next to a late 90s Corsa or an old Peugeot estate parked up at a level crossing, it just looks like an alien spaceship. It is extraordinary. Still ugly, but extraordinary. What must they be thinking? <laughs> It's a bit like high fashion. You see pictures of an outrageous outfit on the catwalk, and sure, you think, but that's dry clean only. But if you saw someone walking down the street in it, you'd think they were insane. Who knows, perhaps a racily cut combination of taffeta and wetsuit fabric married to six inch heels could be the perfect thing for a wet Wednesday in Wigan. But surely a 789 brake horsepower car with nearly slick rubber and a wing the width of a sofa isn't going to work on a bumpy B road, is it? I wasn't sure how this car would feel on the road. It, it could feel a bit like trying to use a Hasselblad to take holiday snaps. But almost as soon as I got into it, I was enjoying it far more than I expected. The thing I was most impressed with on the track was the braking performance. It takes you a couple of pushes just to get used to how hard you have to lean on that left-hand pedal. And once you're used to it, it's something you can use again and again on the road and really revel in. More so than the 789 brake horsepower. One thing that hasn't really got any better out with the track is the noise of the engine. Which is, well, sort of brutalist and a bit industrial. Effective it is. Beautiful it is not. Then there's the view out. The cameras have really got that right from the word go. But this one with the addition of these panels down here and these ones up in the roof. No, you don't find yourself looking down at the kerb very often, but just aware of them in your peripheral vision. So they add to this extremely light feeling in here. Light and lightweight because this car does feel like it only weighs 1,200 kilos. Given that it's capable of 0 to 62 miles an hour in 2.8 seconds and 0 to 186 miles an hour in well under 20 seconds, you have to be pretty judicious with how you use the throttle. You worry that a car with so much aero might not be fun on the road, but with nearly 800 brake horsepower, of course it is! With traction control on, this car keeps everything very well reined in. 
return to ESC dynamic, then it really does come alive. This is brilliant. This is so much better than I thought it would be on the road. Yes, you might only be using a fraction of its performance, but what it serves up is so involving. There is another reason for wanting to drive this car on these Middle England roads too. You see, Senna himself spent several years living in Britain, starting in 1981, the year I was born, driving Formula Ford 1600. At one point he had a bungalow in Norwich, and later he bought a house in Eastern Surrey. So I like to imagine that he dashed along lanes just like these to Silverstone or Snatterton, Brands Hatch or Thruxton, Mallory or Alton. I know that early on he had a silver Alpha Sud, then an Escort XR3, then later a Mercedes. Quite what he would have made of this, I really don't know. And just in case you think this is all a bit of a flight of fancy Senna herring across the country, let me tell you a bit of a story. Dennis Russian was the team manager of his Formula Ford 2000 team in 1982. Senna was racing at Donington one day in early April and won the race. And he wandered up to Dennis afterward, garland around his neck and said, uh, let's go to Sneston. My friend Mauricio is racing there in an hour and a half. Now it was a two and a half hour drive across to Sneston from Donington. So Dennis said, we'll never make it. Yes, we will, said Ayrton. Dennis had a, a Mazda at the time. He sat in the front, Spider the mechanic sat in the back. And sure enough, they made it in just over the hour and a half to see the race. Apparently Dennis sat with a book in front of his face most of the time, so he couldn't see the things that were happening. Today, we're going in the other direction, heading like a homing pigeon towards Donington, in order to remember what is arguably Senna's greatest ever lap. In 1993, after an absence of a few years, the European Grand Prix came here, to Donington Park. I was 11 years old at the time and I remember it well, partly because I was F1 mad, partly because it was sponsored by computer games producer Sega. Anyway, in qualifying it was dry and everything went to the form book, with the Williams of Prost and Hill locking out the front row. Third was Schumacher and fourth was Senna. Come race day, however, there was a torrential downpour. What happened next made a lasting impression on anyone that saw it. The distinctive red and white car at Donington in 1993 was this, a McLaren MP4-8. Like today's McLaren Senna, it has a V8, although its displacement is 3.5 as opposed to 4 litres, and it does without the road car's turbochargers. As a result, its 680 brake horsepower lags some 100 brake horsepower behind the Senna, but weighing just 505 kilos, the F1 car is less than half the weight of the still light road car. Both have paddle-operated gear shifts, the F1 car making do with one clutch and six ratios to the road cars two and seven. And as this was the height of the era of electronic assistance in Formula One, so both cars have trick suspension and traction control, although the modern car is the only one with active aerodynamics. Both, of course, have a carbon fibre chassis, and today, the modern road car is going to follow in the wheel tracks of the iconic race car. Comparing today's circuit with that of 1993 is easy, as Donington Park's 2.5 miles and 12 corners remain pretty much identical in 2019, although today they are considerably drier. As for the drivers, well I have two legs and two arms, just like Ayrton Senna, but sadly that's pretty much where the comparisons end. However, I'll do my very best. Fourth on the grid means Senna is on the left-hand side of the track, next to the pit wall. When the lights go out, Ayrton is actually slow away, losing the place as Carl Venling gets up to third. On the run down to Redgate, Michael Schumacher runs Senna out wide into the pit lane exit, but Ayrton dives right and slots up the inside of the Benetton Ford on the brakes. Back to fourth. Next is perhaps the most extraordinary overtake. As the train of cars sweeps downhill through the intimidatingly fast Krenner curves, Ayrton stays wide in the wet and passes the Cyber of Venlinger around the outside of the right-hander. It's a sensational reading of the track and the available grip. 
Third place is his. Such is Senna's speed that he isn't even compromised through the old hairpin, and on the run-up to the next corner he's all over the gearbox of Damien Hill's Williams Renault. As a result, it's like taking candy from a baby as he easily slips down the inside under braking and claims. He's now up to second. Hill struggles for traction on the exit, but Senna is smoothly away and hunting down his final quarry, Alain Prost. The Frenchman is no slouch in the rain, and Senna has ground to make up out of coppice and down Starker straight. And Williams ahead sparking over the slight crest halfway down. Through the slow speed S's onto the Melbourne loop, then Senna dives out of the spray and squirms down the inside on the brakes. First place from fifth. Into the lead in less than one lap. Extraordinary. And that last overtake down here into the Melbourne hairpin was of course the one that Senna really wanted because it was Prost. Halfway through the overtake you can see the Frenchman glance across to his right, almost incredulous at seeing the Brazilian there on his inside. The rest of the race, well, it was very much a case of it being mixed conditions I think you'd say. Wet, then dry, then wet again and Senna was a master of those conditions, as he always had been. He made fewer pit stops than his nearest rivals and came out on top. Hill was in second place that day, over a minute behind. Everyone else, including Prost, had lapped. For me though, it's that single first lap that encapsulates so much of what made Senna special. It highlighted his ability to go straight from the gun, extracting speed from cold tyres when others were feeling their way more tentatively into the unknown. It also showcased his skill in the wet, whether it was Snetterton in 81, Monaco in 84, Estoril in 85 or Donington in 93, Senna had the ability to make the rest of a grid look like amateurs when there was moisture in the air. And finally, it was fitting that the lap should culminate in an overtake on Prost, the supreme rival who helped define the Brazilian's career. Of course, just over a year later, in 1994, the world would lose Ayrton Senna de Silva for good on the same weekend as Roland Ratzenberger. I remember that weekend also so well. It's emblazoned on my mind. But I prefer to remember Senna for that day in 1993 and specifically that first lap here at Donington. Thanks for watching. This film was made by the team over on our sister channel Carfection. You can find a link to their channel on screen now. And if you enjoyed this longer film, then why not subscribe to us right here on Roadshow so you don't miss an episode.